Hello, my name is Anna Tam. I'm a singer and player of uh, string instruments and one of the questions I'm asked most often is what is this instrument? This is an instrument I fell in love with a few years ago and it is called a nickel harper. To tell you about it, it's probably best that we travel back in time. Uh, it's a Swedish instrument in, in general that can be disputed but you'll find out why as I explain. But the earliest potential evidence we have for this instrument comes from these keys at the moment. So one of these keys has been found in Sigtuna, which is north of Stockholm, and that's dated to around 1200. Now, a nickel harper is not the only instrument with keys. Also, a hurdy-gurdy, which is a drone instrument that's played with keys, and it's rather than bowed, turned with a crank. So these instruments are probably quite related to each other. The next piece of evidence we have of nickel harpers is in 1350 or so, where there is a church, Kalunga church in Gothland, Sweden, where there are two carvings of nickel harper players on the, on the church, on the gate. And then we have in 1408, a painting of an angel in Siena in Italy, also playing the nickel harper or a keyed fiddle. You can see that the design is very similar to a viol, um, other medieval bowed string instruments around at the time. And going forward with that kind of design, we also have more depictions on churches in Sweden, Denmark and Germany in the medieval era. And here is one from this church is from 1460 to 1525, Tofta Church in Sweden. And it also shows an angel playing the nickel harper. So we have a few depictions from the medieval era like that. It's mentioned in Pretorius' 1620 uh, books in Tagma Musicum and we have an instrument probably after then, the Mora Harper, so called because it's from Mora Delana, Sweden. Uh, it has on the back of it written 1526 but an expert, Per Ulf Almo, who is a researcher in nickel harpers and nickel harper history, feels that it's more likely the instrument could be around 1680. So we don't know, but this would fit in because the design is very like that in the book and it's inspired by that. Early nickel harpers did not have as many keys, did not have as many strings as this one. So one of the earlier kinds, the 17th century one, would have um, been called a contrabass harper and you would have had the keys. You see one of, um, one of these notes is moved by, by the keys, one of those uh, strings is played, but you can also, the earlier ones, have two rows of keys, three strings, and they, the one key will move both of them, much as it does in a hurdy-gurdy, and they would have, have had drone strings. So, because the nickel harper had drones, was more of a folk instrument, there's not a lot of information or research done in the past because I think it wasn't considered a noteworthy instrument. One of the most beautiful things and unique things, in a way, about the instrument is that it has 12 sympathetic strings. You can see here the gold string set into the bridge, and I'm going to just play through those, and you're going to hear every note of a chromatic scale. And this is, and, and so on, and this came about in around the late 1600s, the early 1700s. So sympathetic strings or resonant strings, so we don't play them, but they just sing along when we play, were introduced to England in around 1600 from the Near East. Um, considered something quite exciting. They were on viola d'amores, another early instrument similar to this one and that's probably where the idea came from because they were pretty popular in Sweden. So I've told you about the contrabass harper and the mora harper. Other, other harpers existed on the journey um, until the, the um, most common one used now. You can see I've got here four rows of keys. So I have four playing strings but the most common would be the traditional Swedish model which has three rows of keys. A three row chromatic, we say chromatic because all of your notes you can play. You can't, you're not just limited to one scale but you can play any of them. And this was developed by August Bolin in around uh, 1929. 
So this is, that is the type of nickel harp. It looks very similar to this one, but just three rows of keys that most Swedish people will be playing now. Most, most people, indeed, are playing now. And this traditional tuning, there we go, would be A, C, G, C. But I've tuned mine to A, D, G, C, which is probably the next most popular way of tuning your nickel harper, but the traditional way would be A, C, G, C. Um, this four row nickel harper is um, made by Johannes Meyer, this particular one, and I think he'd made an absolutely beautiful job of it. So I have 55 keys across my four rows, and a traditional Swedish one would have something more like 37 keys. Okay, why am I playing a Swedish instrument with medieval history in the 21st century? Because of a man called Erik Salström, who kept the instrument popular. So in the early 20th century, it was dying out, partly because of the popularity of the accordion, but he was a fantastic player, fantastic also composer of tunes, and he repopularized it really in the 60s and the 70s. He made evening classes, and this kept it going, and now it's an instrument which is thriving. Um, Lots of players in Sweden, lots of players throughout the world. It's um, growing all the time, so that's how I came to discover it.